Welcome everybody in the lecture room, welcome everybody in Zoom, welcome everybody from the future. Today we are going to have a theoretical lecture again. It's actually the probably the most fun lecture of the entire semester because it's going to be covered with mathematics and uh, and uh, formalism. Um, the goal of this, the reason why we are doing all this, is really so that you know how to design good schemas. Because you have a lot of freedom in the way you decide the, you know, the schema, it's the attributes you have in the tables, it's the types of the columns and so on. Um, but it's easy to get it wrong. And I'm going to explain what it means to get it wrong. And then I'm going to give you the whole theory. It's actually several decades of research and uh, still ongoing um, about uh, best practices. And I will equip you with, uh, with a formal understanding of all these things. All right, before we do, I have a question for you. Right here, just to check your knowledge. What is this? So, ah, of course, just a moment. Um, that's the demo effect I had connected just a few minutes ago. To do it again. Sharing again. Yep, awesome. Now we have it. So you have here a SQL query, you recognize SQL, and I'm giving you four characterization um, potentially of this query in the relational algebra in terms of uh, uh, operators. So I need you to tell me which one of the four actually corresponds to what the SQL query is doing. So remember that what you're expected to know how to do is to map between a sentence in English, a SQL query, and the relational algebra. You're supposed to, uh, to know how these things map together. Let me show the query again better because you cannot see it fully on the screen. <clears throat> so select. E dot name, P dot price, S dot discount, S dot customer. You remember that with the dot, we can give names to a table, right? So from products, P joins sales S. So P is an alias for products and S for sales. So we join on P's PID equals S's products. And then S's number is greater than 10 in the where clause. So is that in, an inner join combined with two selections? Is that an inner join followed by a selection and a projection? Is that a full outer join combined with a selection and a projection? Or is that a natural join combined with a projection? So it tests your knowledge of what a selection is, what a projection is, and the difference between inner and outer join and natural join. Let me see what you have answered so far. We have majority with the inner join followed by a selection and a projection, and this is indeed the correct answer. So let's explain why. It's not a natural join because in, an, in a natural join, you might remember that the, the thing we join on is the column names that are on both sides, right? There is no on in the middle, on P, PID, S is product. Uh, here, PID and product are not the same name. That's why it's not a natural join, it's a theta join. Uh, now, it's an inner join because that's the default. If we wanted an outer join, full outer, left outer, right outer, then we would have explicitly said so in SQL, right? Since we just say join, then it's uh, it's an inner join. Uh, and then you can see that it has a projection in the where clause, right? The, 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 sorry, a selection in the where clause. The selection is always in the where clause. And then a projection to four columns name and price that came from the left and discount and customer that came from the right, okay? So it's an inner join followed by a selection and projection. For whom is that clear? Any questions I saw right then? Maybe I give you, I'll give you the microphone. Doesn't always work, but uh, people on Zoom can hear you. There you go. 
Normally, yes. Yeah. And I just, I work. Okay, just, yes, 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 of course. Yes, the correct projection. Um, so the project. Uh, so I, I, I have the problems mm -hmm. to differentiate to the selection. Okay. Ah, okay, yes, of course, of course. So the question was about uh, the differentiation between what a selection is and what a projection is. It actually has to do with whether you pick rows or columns. So the selection is going to take a subset of the rows. It's working uh, like this. Um, let me let me show. Like the, the selection is going to to take rows. And uh, the projection is working on columns, right? So if you have uh, four rows and four columns and you select, then maybe you're going to end up with two rows and four columns, right? But if you select, the number of columns doesn't change. If you project, then you might end up with four rows and two columns. Then the number of rows doesn't change. It's only the number of columns that changes. If both the number of columns and rows change, then it means that it's a selection plus a projection, right? And that's the sort of thing that many of you probably already did in Excel or spreadsheet software, right? Uh, when you select, uh, when you activate the data filter feature in a spreadsheet, then you can click on the column headers and it pops up with a list of the distinct values. Then you can check or uncheck the values that you want to keep, show and not show. And this is automatically going to do a selection on the, on the records and it's only going to show you the records that match this. Um, for a projection in Excel, it's uh, uh, the way you do this is by clicking, selecting an entire column, and then you can right click and say hide, for example, then it removes from the view, or you can even delete, but hiding is, uh, is probably a better idea, right? So projection takes a subset of the columns, selection takes a subset of the rows. Now, some of the confusion might have to do with the facts that it might be misleading in SQL, the selection is always in the where clause, right? Where S number greater than 10, that's the selection predicate. And the pro projection is after the select keywords. That is the one thing that might be uh, confusing, right? So what we have after select, name, price, discount, customer, that is the projection. There might have been 10 columns in total in these two tables. We only take four of them, it's a projection. And then we only pick the records for which the number is greater than 10, and that gives us the selection, right? Does it clarify? Yeah. Yeah, awesome. And it might be it were, that it was useful for many other people, so uh, I'm happy to have answers. Yes, go ahead. Yes, the inner join and the natural join. So the way you can see it is, uh, oh yeah, it won't show anything, it doesn't project me on that. Um, if you look at the query, you see, from products join sales on PID equals product. This is how you see it's not a natural join because if you manually specify the predicates and you say, I'm matching the records from products and sales so that the products PID is equals to the sales product column, uh, then this is an inner join. It's not a natural join. It's not a natural join. A natural join would have meant that, for example, instead of being called product on the sales table, instead of being called product, it would have been called, for example, PID as well. And then you would have on p.pid equals s.pid, right? Then you don't need to do it anymore. You can just uh, remove completely and just, uh, just uh, 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 join naturally, just using the column that have the same names on both sides. That's a natural join, right? So theta join, you explicitly specify the predicate and natural join, you do not have to because it's naturally done based on the, on the columns that are on both sides, all right? So theta join is the general name of what's not natural, so the part where you specify the predicate. And then the inner outer has to do with whether or not you include the records that don't have any, have any matches on the other side, right? If it's an inner join, you only have the records that match and those that don't have any match, they are not in the result. The outer join means that uh, if you have a record on the left that doesn't have any match on the right, you include it with nulls, fields on the left side. And if you have a record coming from the right that doesn't have any match on the left, then you have nulls on the left side and you include it. That's the full outer join. 
And left outer join and right outer join means that you only do that for one side or the other, right? Left outer join means if a record on the left doesn't have any match, you include it, but a record on the right, you don't include it. And the right outer join is the opposite, right? You have a record on the right that doesn't match any on the left and you include it, but the record on the left that doesn't have any match, you don't, right? And full, you do everything, okay? And you have the syntax in SQL, you can specify inner join, outer join, and so on, but by default, it's going to be a, a, a inner join if you, if you don't say anything, okay? Does it help? Right? It's a lot to digest, right, all, all these kinds of joins. So it's really useful to really take the time and go through them and uh, make sure that you're, that you're familiar with all that. All right? Any other questions? Okay. You know that we are ahead of time compared to last semester. I'm actually 45 minutes ahead of time. Last semester, so last year, in that hour, I was actually finishing on SQL. So I really have time to answer questions. Um, okay, so uh, if that's all clear, then we'll move on to database design theory and uh, do again of the theoretical parts. Right. It's a lot of slides, but don't worry, we won't do everything today. It's going to be spread over today, next week. And if necessary, we'll even continue the week after that. All right. So it's going to be formal, meaning there's going to be a lot of definitions. Um, it was also scary for me at first when I started uh, learning all of this because that's a lot of things, a lot of intuition to develop. And the way that it's actually typically taught, especially if you look at the textbooks uh, for computer science students, it's a lot of mathematical formulas, right? So this is, this is very scary and you really have to understand what every formula does. What I'm going to try to do is to avoid putting too many formulas. There will be a few, but I'm going to try to rather focus on communicating to you the intuition and the visuals of all of that so that you really understand what is going on in there, right? Um, so let's go to it. Who is ready? Yes, all right, let's go for it. So where are we? Um, we know what a relation is or a table or a relational table, that's all the same. Um, we define them formally as sets of maps, sets of records. Um, and then we learn to manipulate them because we can develop a full calculator, just like you can add and subtract and multiply numbers. You can select and project and join and uh, union and a lot of other things on relational tables, right? So just like numbers, we're able to, be, to make them dance around and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, to modify them and manipulate them thanks to the relational algebra and the SQL language uh, when we want to have a computer do it for us. Okay, now, if that's all I teach you, and then you just go ahead and create a website, let's say you want to sell some things on the internet and you set up a website with a relational database like PostgreSQL in the background, um, that's something that a lot of people go through when they create a startup and they, and they, and they start doing that, they have to come, come, to come up with a database schema. You can get it wrong. If you, if you don't have the best practices, you can get it wrong. So I'm going to first go, I'm going to first try to give you an intuition of what it means to get it wrong. This is an example. Uh, let's say it's a, it's a, it's a web shop uh, that sells uh, phones, laptops, televisions, and so on with prices and customers. I just anonymized them with the first name. It's all made up anyway. Uh, quantity ordered and the city uh, from which they ordered, right? So imagine that this is the table, uh, the schema that the founders of, of this web shop came up with. Um, so they put the, web, the, the website online, uh, people can start ordering, uh, they will have to update the inventory, they will have to update the prices because as you know, they might evolve. New orders are going to arrive, uh, maybe old data will get deleted when it's, uh, when it's too old and so on and so on and so on. Maybe customers will have to update their address, like they are not in Zurich anymore, but in Bern and so on and so on. So this table, is going to have a life. It's not going to stay like this, right? It's going to change. And in fact, if they have a lot of success and millions of customers, um, then it's going to change very fast. Like every second, there's going to be SQL updates against the table and it's going to, to, to evolve, right? So this is called online transactional processing when, when the database works in this way. But let's look at what could go wrong in there because this table actually, if you look closer, 
you might notice a few things. For example, you might notice that the phone is worth 800 francs, right? And uh, we say, we imagine it's the same one for sim simplification. And every time we write 800, the laptop costs 2,000 francs and the TV 1,000 francs, right? Then you see that John is in Zurich. So every time John appears, it's in Zurich. Mary is in Basel uh, and Peter is in Bern, right? Uh, and then there's the quantities. For example, John ordered one phone uh, for 800 francs delivered to Zurich, okay? Now we could, for example, delete that record, imagine that the uh, the, the record is uh, is uh, 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 is getting old, or maybe the order gets cancelled by uh, by Peter. And then let's see what happens. We remove it, but then you realize that we don't know anymore anything about Peter. We don't know where he lives anymore, and that's because there was customer data in there. But the intent that we have was to delete an order. So because of this schema, if I delete the order, I also lose the information on Peter, right? So this is a problem. This is the first problem that we have. It's called the deletion anomaly, right? Um, now, imagine that I want to delete. Mary has ordered many things. She ordered a phone, a laptop, and a television. She's a loyal customer. And then uh, she cancels the order for the uh, television that costs 1,000 francs. So I go ahead and delete that. Now. What happens? We lost the information on the TV. I don't even know how much it costs. So if other people want to buy it, I won't be able to tell them how much it costs anymore. So you see, this is a problem because the schema was not well designed here. So we, we really are running into issues, right? So now you could say, okay, we can kind of fix that by only deleting that part in here and preserving the price of the TV, but then nobody orders it. But you probably see that it starts being like a hack, right? It's uh, it's uh, that, that that doesn't sound very clean this way of doing the database because you you need to remember that every time you delete, you need to test was it the last one, and if it was the last one, I add back nulls, and then if I add an order, then I need to re notice that they are nulls, and now I can fill the nulls with uh, the order and so on. So that that sounds like very costly to actually maintain things if we want to make them work uh, in this way. Um, so that's the deletion anomaly, but something else can go wrong. For example, imagine that I want to change the price of my phone um, because there was, a, let's say, a, a shortage of supply, and I want to increase it to 850. But I do it here, and I forgot about the other places. Now I have a problem because my phone price is inconsistent. So you might think, OK, these are past orders that the price they paid, right? But what do I display on the website? If the information is like this, I just don't know. Is it 850? Is it 800? Right? I, I, I basically have inconsistencies. So this is called an update anomaly in here. We no longer have a unique price associated with the phone, even though we wanted that. Uh, and then finally, the third kind of anomaly is called the insertion anomaly. The insertion anomaly happens when I want to add a new product. So imagine that now I want to sell USB sticks as well. Um, and uh, nobody ordered them yet. So what do I put in there? So you might put nulls, you know, and so on. But basically, you need to put something in there. So again, it doesn't sound very clean to do it in this way, right? Uh, the same if a new customer registers, but they haven't ordered anything yet. Then I would add like Bill from Lausanne uh, ordered uh, order uh, wants to register to my web shop, but they haven't ordered anything. So of course I could put nulls everything right everywhere. Um, but again, it's uh, it's fishy. Who who feels this thing? That that's not the way to go. That it's wrong. Yes. Okay. Very good. So you have the intuition. Um, and the idea, if we want to now put into words the reason why this doesn't quite work in this way is that this relational table stores too much. It has the customer information, it has the product information, it has the information of what they bought, and so on, and so on, and so on. You shouldn't be doing that. The rule of thumb in databases, and that comes from database design theory, is that you should have a separate table for everything that you need. There should be a separate table for the product, a separate table for the customers, and so on, and so on. You should, should really have several tables uh, and make them work in this way, like this, for example. Now, I have a table for my products. You see, the phone costs 800 francs. The duplicates are gone now. It's no longer duplicated. The laptop, 2,000. HGTV, 1,000. USB stick, 10 francs. 
Uh, I have information on the customers in the bottom right, right? I know that there's John from Zurich, Peter from Bern, Mary from Basel, and Bill from Lausanne. And then I have my sales in the middle, what the customers actually bought. So I see that John bought a phone, one phone, Peter bought two phones, and so on and so on. How do I put it all together? Like, how do I want to know, for example, uh, where my phones, how many phones got delivered in Zurich? What sort of things do I need to do with these tables? Yes? Exactly, primary and foreign keys. So that's exactly the idea. And what do you do? What is the verb when you put them, them together? Okay. So let's look first at the primary foreign key. So this here, the customer, let's say I'm using the first name, it's probably not a good idea in reality, right? But let's say that this is my primary key to my customers. And here for my sales, this is here a foreign key that points to the customer. Just like here, this is a foreign key that points to the product. In practice, you would use uh, uh, numbers, right? Or part numbers, or, you know, there's basically references for the products and the uh, customer IDs, right? Customer references. But basically we have a foreign key here that points here and a foreign key here that points to that primary key. Right. What is the uh, the verb, the operation that I will do now with these tables to put them together? Anybody? Starts with a J. Yes. Uh, group is if so that answers the query I said before when we say, for example, how many phones would be ordered from Zurich? You would use a group by absolutely. So you would need to group on the city. What if you want to combine these two tables together? A join, yes, exactly. It's a join. That's exactly the idea. You can basically join these tables together in order to uh, to uh, do queries such as grouping by city if you want to uh, to ag ag aggregate. And if you join these tables together, you basically get back this, right? This is the idea. So what I did in order to have a better schema in that case is that I decomposed my table here instead of a single table. I cut it into several pieces in such a way that if I join these pieces back together, I get the original table. That's what happened here. So the intuition here of what we want to do for better schemas is we have smaller tables, we have more tables, and we will join them with SQL in order to, uh, to, uh, to uh, extract information, right? For whom does that make sense? Right? So that's the first intuition that we, we, we want to do this. In a way, since we need to join them back here on the fly, it means that what we did here is the opposite of a join, right? It's the opposite of a join when we actually separate them. Okay, so that's the first intuition. And the theory behind this that tells you how this should be done is called database design theory. So I'm going to start with the first normal form. And as you might imagine, there's the second normal form, a third normal form, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, it sounds a bit like almost music theory, right? When you have when you're learning an instrument and so on, and you you, you have to learn all the notes and so on. So I start with the first normal form. But actually, I have an awesome piece of news for you. You already know the first normal form. I just didn't call it that way. Do you remember atomic consistency? Right on tables, I told you there's relational consistency. Uh, there's atomic consistency, so, uh, so integrity, atomic integrity, relational integrity, and domain integrity. Well, it turns out uh, that the name for the first normal form, I called it atomic integrity, but it is actually the first normal form. This is the first thing you want to, uh, to do right. Uh, so just as a reminder, we said that a relational table is a set of maps, right? It, uh, or maps are partial functions from the attributes to the values. And I want it to fulfill relational domain and atomic integrity. Now, let's focus now, since that's the first normal form of this atomic consistency. What it does not mean is this. This is not, uh, this doesn't fulfill atomic integrity. Why? Exactly, they are, they are arrays and they are forbidden because this is not atomic, this is a structure and I'm not allowed to do that. So this is not in atomic consistency. This is also not in atomic consistency. Exactly, nested tables inside. That's exactly the intuition. You cannot have nested tables, nested arrays, nested objects, and so on. 
Here I would have objects. If you know JSON, this, uh, this, it doesn't matter if you don't, but this is all forbidden because these are structures. You, you cannot have anything that is too complex in there. It must be atomic. And here nested tables, as you uh, rightfully commented on Zoom, uh, this is not allowed in the atomic integrity. And now I can say it's not alone in the first normal form because now I can call it first normal form. Okay. Uh, this now is another example of how the table might have been um, if I didn't even have a table in the first place. It's the same example I gave you earlier, even though I didn't put everything in there, there's not the CT. Um, but basically here I have the phone and orders by John, Peter, and Mary. Then I have a laptop and orders by John and Mary and a TV ordered by Mary and so on. This is even worse than what I told you about late, uh, earlier with the anomalies because now it's not even, in, it's not even uh, it doesn't even have atomic integrity. It's not even in the first normal form, right? So this you should really avoid, except in big data, but they have good reasons to do that. But in this course, we avoid them. We don't want this. And the way we do that is very simple. We just say that all the types of the columns must be atomic types. I can have strings, I can have dates, I can have numbers, I can have booleans. I cannot have tables or arrays or objects or whatever, only atomic values. That is an example with only atomic values, see? Uh, so in the first column, I have strings. The second one, I have strings. Then I have booleans in the third column and integer is in the, in the fourth column, okay? So no nested tables, no nested structures, just small atomic, well, they don't have to be small. You could have a huge string, but nevertheless, just atomic values that, uh, that don't have any structure. Okay, so now I'm giving you plenty of examples, right? So now I even call it set of maps, the nested structure, but this is not okay. This is not in the first normal form. Uh, this is in the first normal form because there are no nested arrays. And of course, that gives us kind of an algorithm that is actually intuitive. And one of you actually observed that a couple of, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I remember in, uh, in, uh, in the first lectures, is that if a table is not in the first normal form, which is the case for the table in the left, which has nested tables, it's not in the first normal form, and we want to fix it. How do we fix it? We turn it into a table in the first normal form. And the trick to do that is to duplicate these things. Right? We basically have John 1, we extend it with phone 800. Then we do the same, Peter 2 extend it with phone 800 and so on and so on. So we kind of pay a price, it's the duplication. We duplicate these values in there. We, we duplicate them as many times as there are records here. And now we get a table in the first normal form, right? It has a cost because we introduce duplication. So this is why we have even higher normal forms to fix that. But at least now we have atomic integrity, we are in the first normal form. So question to you now, who feels that if I show you a table, you can quickly tell me yes or no, it's in the first normal form. All right, now, if I give you a table that is not in the first normal form with nested tables, who would be able to do this for any table with nested tables that I give you to duplicate the values in this way and build the table? Some of you, okay, you can train yourself uh, offline if you want to, to do it, but it's really the idea of duplicating the outer values, uh, the, the columns that are not nested, you just duplicate them. You can even generalize it to multiple levels of nesting in this way, all right? And the lesson again that we learned here is that we paid a price for that because here we didn't have duplication on the left, but now we, when, we actually, uh, when we actually force it to be in the first normal form, we do have duplication, okay. Uh, all right, that was the first normal form. And again, it was easy to teach because this one you already knew from the very beginning of the lecture. Okay, now uh, the next thing that I would like to go into is the notion of a table universe. It sounds scary, it's actually not scary. Um, the idea is that when you create a website like that, I told you that you create a schema, you put data in there, but then the data is going to change all the time. Every second with the customers using your website, the table has a life. So basically the part, so the schema will not change, right? But that part will change. It evolves over time. I add records, I delete records. records. So it means that 
I left to right, that could be a possible evolution of the table. We might even have millions of these if you, if you let it go for a year, for example. There's a huge number of possible extensions. So I called it an extension, the part with the, uh, the data, right? So it evolves. But it evolves under a constraint. It evolves under the constraints that these are the attributes. They don't change. And these are the types. They don't change. And by using PostgreSQL, you know that these constraints are fulfilled because if they are not, PostgreSQL will complain, right? So this is the, the benefit of using a database system like PostgreSQL. It will ensure that these constraints are fulfilled, right? So it will always be a relational table. It will have domain integrity because it will only accept the values that have the proper types. It will have relational integrity because you can only have, add values in the columns that exist. And it has atomic integrity because the types that are in there are all atomic types, right? And you have other kinds of constraints. You might remember that I showed you in the when we designed the tables that you can have unique constraints in SQL, right? You can also require that a value in a column is always different. There is also a check constraints where you can specify, for example, that a value must be always greater than a thousand. That is a check constraint. PostgreSQL will do it for you automatically. You just need to declare your constraint and it's going to check it. So you have these integrity constraints. They must hold at all times. There is a question. Yes, exactly. I realize your microphone was not activated, so I will I will repeat. Does it work now if you speak? Uh, yes. Yeah, now it does. Yeah. Um, so basically, the question is. Um, what happens if multiple customers want to modify the same value at the same time? This is something that is a known problem in databases, and it's fixed with transactions, the notion of transactions. This is something we are going to see in, in a couple of weeks, probably in, in uh, three or four weeks. Um, transactions, the ability to make sure that you don't get in trouble if multiple people want to touch the same data, is one of the core benefits of a, of a relational database management system. Because if you don't have PostgreSQL and you want to do it manually in Python, this is going to cost you millions of dollars to build a system that is going to, uh, uh, to resist these kind of things. But PostgreSQL has all of that, uh, and it's free. Um, so the idea, just to give you an intuition without uh, anticipating too much on what we are going to do, uh, the idea of transactions uh, is that you trick the users into making them believe that they are the only user of the system. So you basically implement the whole database in such a way that when you connect to the system, you don't feel that there's a million other people who are using the same system. And there's a theory behind that uh, that allows you to do these things. It's called uh, the serializability of a schedule. We'll go into all these things. Um, and it's like spaghetti disentanglement. It's like if several people are executing queries at the same time, uh, you enforce that you could technically uh, change the order of the queries to disentangle them in such a way that it looks like there was one person and then the other person who did the query. And, uh, and then, it's, uh, then it's clean, right? Um, so you're absolutely right to, uh, to, uh, to mention this because this is very important and it's so important that we, we're going to have a full lecture on, uh, on transactions on these things, right? So here for this week, I'm assuming that it's sequential. So we really have the queries one after the other and there is a linear, uh, a linear development here of the evolution of the table. Did I answer your question? Even though I kind of said I will answer it in four weeks, but yeah, all right. Very good. Um, so now, uh, what the system gives you, PostgreSQL, is that you have this universe, and it will make sure you remain within what is valid, what fulfills all of these constraints. And if you ever try to insert, to change something that would break a constraint, it will simply not let you. There will be an error, and it will say, sorry, can't do it. There are these constraints, and so on. All right. This is, by the way, why sometimes you get an error when you log into a website and then you get this uh, scary 500 uh, server error and so on. It's that sort of things, right? But 
the burden was on the developers of the websites. Okay, now if I use that's called the Venn diagram, right? That the mathematicians do this in a set theory, so they represent the sets with circles like this. And when a circle is within another circle, then it's basically an inclusion that the set is included. So what that gives me is a visual on uh, on um, all the tables I accept in my universe. So all of that here is all the collections, all the sets of maps, right? All of those that I that I could accept. Then I throw in one constraint, the relational integrity, right? And I get a table that all the maps have the same columns. Then I throw in the domain integrity constraint, maybe even based on that, right? That schema right there. And then I throw in the atomic integrity, right? And I get the set of relational tables with these three constraints, right? And then you can have tables with further constraints. This is where your SQL schema comes in, right? So you could have this schema. It's actually a create table statement. So it would specify the name of the columns, the types that you have, and then check unique, not null, and so on and so on. All of these constraints coming from the schema, right? So now I'm looking specifically here at the tables that fulfill my schema. And then I can add more and more and more constraints, right? So it's all about constraining the types of tables that I want, okay? Uh, so it's oversimplified here, but this is, this, the idea. this is the idea. And so what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be introducing new kinds of constraints on tables. One of them will be functional dependencies, that a functional dependency may or may not be fulfilled by a table. Higher normal forms, because we saw the first normal form, but we will see that there is the second normal form, the third normal form, and then and I have no idea why, but the 3.5 normal form, it's not called the fourth because the fourth is something else. Um, so we look into one, two, three and 3.5 normal forms. Okay. And again, the idea is that you have all of these constraints that restrict what you accept in your universe and anything else would not be allowed and would be uh, would be uh, an error by the system right so in that case it breaks relational integrity you cannot have this because you need these four columns you here it breaks uh, domain integrity why probably why does it break domain integrity yes because here we are expecting uh, uh, numbers but these are not numbers and here i break uh, by design intent, so here it's not it's not relational integrity, it's not domain integrity, it's not economic integrity, it's something else. Is that you notice that I have phone 800, 850, 900, but I don't want that, right? I would I would like to disallow that. We don't know yet how to do this, right? This is new in this lecture that now we want to enforce this kind of constraint that if it's a phone, then it must be all the same prices in there. That's called the functional dependency. All right, shall we go into functional dependencies? All right, we have, yeah, motivation, very good. So here are the functional dependencies. I'm gonna throw in the formula and then I'm going to give you visuals. So I'm taking a relational table R, I'm going giving it a name. I'm taking subsets of attributes, I call them S and T, these are sets of attributes of R. Here's an example, my table R might have the fields uh, name, product, city, quantity, price. The set S might be uh, product and name, and the set T might be price and quantity, right? It's just a, a set of my attributes in my table. I'm always going, I'm trying to be consistent in this lecture. It's already complicated enough that whenever I have sets of attributes, I'm going to call them S, T, U, and so on individual attributes, I will call them A, B, C, D, and so on, right? So to not confuse you. That's something I fixed with previous years because it might have been confusing. So S, T, U, these are sets of attributes. A, B, C, these are single attributes. Okay. So we say that T, set of attributes, is functionally dependent on S, another set of attributes. We even have a notation with this row, S, a row, T. That's a functional dependency. If, and here I'm throwing my formula at you, but no, don't worry because we are gonna spend time on that. If whatever two tuples I pick, two records in my table, I call them T1 and T2, two records. 
if these two records that I picked from the table have the same values for the attributes in S, so for all A, A is a single attribute, for any attribute that is in my set S, the two tuples match. T1 and T2 have the same value. That's the case, for example, here. Phone 800, phone 800, phone 800, right? So here I could have two tuples. They both have phone in there, right? So these two tuples have the same value. So if they match for all attributes in S, then they must match for all attributes in T. If that's true, then I have a functional dependency. So again, you see the direction. S functionally implies, I like to say functionally implies to read that. So S functionally implies T. It means that if you have tuples that match on all attributes in S, then they must match also in all attributes in T. Right. There's a small abbreviation. If you're too lazy and you don't want to have these for all attributes in S, they match. You can directly write T1.S. It's a bit of a, of a shortcut because normally when I showed you this dot here, T1.A, A should be an attribute. We just generalize this a bit and say T1.S. When we say T1.S equals T2.S, it means that T1 and T2 have the same values for any attribute in S, right? So if any two tuples who match on S also match on T, then I have a functional dependency. It's best with a picture, really. So here, uh, visually, you notice that if I have, imagine that if you have two tuples, when they match on A and B, so this is S, it's AB, here, these two tuples match on A and B, right? So they match on that set of attributes. They have the same values. If I have the functional dependency, AB functionally implies DE, then they must also match here. You see it's the case, foo and foo bar and bar, they match here. Then they also match here, true, true, one, one. Then we say that AB functionally implies DE. This is S, this is T. You see that it's also true, it must be true for any tuples, right? And here I take two other tuples, they match on A, they match on B, so they match on S. And it must be true that they also match on T, so they match on D here and they match on E. If this is always true, no matter what two tuples you pick, if they agree on A and they agree on B, then they also agree on D and E. That's a functional dependency. It basically means that if you know the value of A and B, then you know with certainty the value of D and E. That's what it means. Okay. And I found a way normally to remove this thing at the bottom of the lecture hole so that you can see it. Did it disappear? It's supposed to disappear. Yes, exactly. So you see, I wrote it right here. AB, it's a set of attributes. AB functionally implies DE, means any two tuples who agree on A and B must also agree on D and E. Who has a first intuition now of what it means, all right? Very good. This is a counterexample. This is a counterexample where you see that these two tuples agree on A and B, but they disagree on D and E, right? So they, they agree on E, but they don't agree on D. This is breaking the functional dependency. So we say that this table here does not respect this functional dependency. It breaks it. Now I have, coming back to the example that we have before with my products and my prices, if I want to say that a product must always have the same price, formally, I just said that product functionally implies price. If any two tuples have the same product, they must agree on the price. Now you can see it's true. If the two tuples agree that they are phones, the price must be 800. If the two tuples agree that they are laptops, then they must be 2000 for the price. And HDTV, there's only one, right? So uh, we already, I already said the universal quantification, the empty set is always true, right? So since there's never two tuples with the TV, then this is trivially true. Okay. Who sees this product functionally implies price? This is basically very good. Now I'm lazy. Computer scientists are lazy. And I hate to write curly braces everywhere. Uh, because if every time we need to write a functional dependency, I would need to write my set of attributes with the curly brace and the comma and so on and so on. It just uh, 
it's it's uh, it's uh, it's crazy. So what is done in the textbook, and I'm going to do this, doing the same in my slides, is I drop the curly braces, I drop the commas, I directly re write this. It's a bit of an abuse of notation, but I basically say A, B functionally implies D, E. Right? So you deserve the break, and then we'll continue on this in 15 minutes, so at uh, 15 past 11. See you soon. <laughs>